Hi, and welcome to Concordia Online. I'm Greg, I'm the pastor here at Concordia, and I just want to say welcome, and thank you so much for being here today. Uh, a few things I want to share with you before we get started. Uh, one is that we are open for in-person worship, and so if that works for you and you're comfortable, we'd love to have you. Uh, we're taking safety precautions, social distancing, masks, uh, hand sanitizer all over the place. So um, if, if that works for you, um, like I said, we'd love to have you. We have two worship services on Sunday mornings. One is at 8.15. Uh, and the other one's at 10.30. The 8.15 is our traditional worship service, and the uh, 10.30 is our contemporary worship service. Along with that, uh, between services, we have our adult Bible study, uh, and that's in person as well. So we'd love to have you join us for that if that works for you. Uh, if, if you can't be here for whatever reason, again, if you're not comfortable or maybe you're, you're away, uh, we do Zoom that Bible study. It's uh, Again, it's at 9.30. Uh, in the morning, Sunday mornings, and uh, Zoom information is on our website, which I'll be getting to here in a second. Uh, you can also join us for a Zoom Bible study. The same Bible study, we just do it again on Tuesday mornings, uh, and that's at 9.30. And, and that Zoom link, like I said, I'll be telling you about here uh, in just a second. I do want to tell you about our Holy Week services. Those will be coming up this week. Uh, so we have a Maundy Thursday worship at 6.30. Uh, we'll be having communion, uh, the stripping of the altar. Uh, we have our Good Friday services. One is at 12 o'clock noon, and the other one is at 6.30 on Good Friday, and then we have our Easter morning services, 8, 15, and 10, 30. So I want to make you aware of that schedule. And again, this information is on our website, and that's where I want to take you right now uh, to our website. And let's see. Always helps if I can get into my own phone. All right. So on our website, I encourage you to go there, check it out. Um, if you want to find out the, the latest news and events, go to uh, Connect. And there you'll find our uh, Concordia News. And on there has all the, the information I just talked about, but it has other things that are going on as well. And I just want to show you some of these or talk to you about some of these things, our Bible studies, uh, Holy Week, those kinds of things. Um, we have started our annual stewardship campaign. Uh, the letter regarding that is on uh, in our news there, so you can go there and check that out, uh, what I've written there. Uh, beyond that, we also uh, have information about our Vacation Bible School. Uh, we'll be having that this summer. It's going to be late July. In fact, the actual dates are July 26th through 29th from uh, 9 a.m. to 11.30. So I'd encourage you uh, to mark those dates on your calendar and don't miss that. It's going to be a great time. Uh, we're, we're so excited uh, to do VBS this summer. So uh, mark your calendars now. Again, that those dates and times are on our website. We're doing a baby supply collection right now. And uh, that, that means diapers, ointment, uh, stuff like that, especially diapers sizes four, five, and six. We're also collecting um, hygiene items as well uh, to make hygiene kits. So if you can help out with that, that would be awesome. We just got word also from foodies that they're running low on, on supplies, including food. So any donations you can make of baby supplies, hygiene items, that would be uh, you know deodorant, shampoo, toothpaste, toothbrushes, and any food items, that would be awesome. Um, you can bring them here in person if you come worship uh, with us on a Sunday morning. You can also, we have bins outside uh, of our lower lot uh, front doors there. You can drop them off, those items off in those bins, and we'll make sure we get those in um, each night. But thank you for that. A whole bunch of other information is on our website, but it's that easy. Go to our website, check it out. Uh, there's information on there about baptisms. Funerals, weddings, all sorts of things. Uh, more stuff that's going on in the congregation. So uh, go to our website. The website address is www.clcgrace.org. On our website, of course, is our contact information. And I want to make note of that because we would love to, to, to meet with you, uh, to chat with you, to talk with you, to answer questions you have, to walk with you in your journey, uh, to meet any needs you might have. So please reach out to us. You can reach out to us by telephone or email. We'd love to meet with you in person if you're comfortable with that. Uh, by phone, talk with you on the phone or email, whatever works for you. Uh, I just want to let you know that we're here for you. Um, finally, what I want to say is this. Thank you. Thank you to all of you uh, who have supported us uh, financially, who have supported us with your prayers, uh, who have supported us with your, with your presence, um, not presence like in uh, birthday and, and Christmas, but presence as in here, right? Uh, uh, your, your actual body, your, your presence in the ways that you have served and just been available. Thank you so much. The ministry that we do here at Concordia that God's given us to do, it takes all of us. We are a body. We're in this together. Uh, so thank you 
whether you're near or far, your support of, like I said, of prayer, of time, of money, your, your tithes and your offerings, uh, they help us accomplish what God has given us all to do. And I believe, as I say in my stewardship letter, um, I believe that we are here. Concordia is here for such a time as this. Uh, so um, check that out. But we're here for you, and thank you for, for your support. Uh, one last thing. You get this question a lot. People ask, well, how can I support? How can I give? Uh, again, if you're, if you're looking to be part of our annual stewardship campaign, in the letter, on our, um, in, in, the, uh, in our letter, there's a uh, link there you can click. Also on the front page, there's a button you can click there, uh, and it talks about how you can give uh, through our stewardship campaign. Uh, you can also give by texting. Just text any amount to the number 84321. Uh, to our website too, there's a giving tab. You can you can click on that and fill that out. Those are secure ways to give. Uh, you can also drop off uh, your tithes or offering in our secure mailbox or join us on a Sunday morning. But I get that question a lot. That's why I bring it up a lot, just to make sure uh, everybody's aware. And again, thank you. Thank you for, for all that you uh, do, your support, your encouragement. Uh, we are indeed the church, and God has given us a mission and a purpose, and we fulfill it together. So thank you. All right, let's get started with prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for this day. Uh, thank you for this opportunity, Lord, that we, can, that we can gather and we can worship in this way. Uh, Lord, we ask for your blessing upon our time, that we might be a blessing to others, that we might carry your great name out into this community, out into this world, uh, Lord, and, 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 uh, and share, share who you are, share your good news, uh, that others might come to know you. Lord, we lift up in particular today um, the, the many people, um, and that really includes all of us, who've been rocked by the, the shooting in Boulder uh, this week, Father. We, we pray for the, the victims' families and friends. Uh, we, we pray for the first responders who were there. We pray for those survivors that were uh, in the store. Lord, we pray for all involved in this. We pray for their healing, their mental, emotional, spiritual healing. And Lord, above all, we pray that through this tragedy, that you, your name would be glorified, that this would not, that people would not turn their backs on you because of this, Lord, but they would turn to you, Lord, to find your hope, your peace, and the only true life that is revealed to all of us through your son, Jesus. So, Lord, while tragedy happens, we know you are a God who works in all things uh, for the good of those who love you. And that, Lord, is what we hold on to. Thank you, thank you, thank you for hearing our prayers as you always do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, so I have to apologize. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I wore this last time or not. I don't think I did. Um, but, you know, I, I, I forget, and I, and I hate to show up, you know, the same week or, you know, two weeks in a row wearing, wearing the same thing. It's not that I have a huge wardrobe at home. Believe me, I don't. Um, I just forget what I wore from week to week. So if, I, if I'm wearing the same thing, again, I don't think I am, um, I apologize. Uh, but it did make me think of, of all of us, right, as, as Christians. Um, how often we forget that we have been clothed with Christ, right? How often as Christians do we forget that because of what Jesus has done for us, by God's grace through faith, we have been clothed with Jesus Christ. He has given us his righteousness, and, and, and he's taken off our old clothes, our old sinful self, and given us a new self. How wonderful is that? But how often do we forget that? Right? How often do we start putting back on those old clothes? Right? We forget that we're actually wearing new clothes. We forget that we're wearing Christ, but we, we go back to the old way of living. Here's what Paul says. Uh, he says this in, in Ephesians chapter 4. He says, um, You did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. This is what Jesus has done for us. Right? He's given us his righteousness and his holiness through his death and resurrection. What good news that is. We are clothed anew in Christ, yet how often, as I said, do we forget that truth and we go on living that old life, that old way of living? Man, we're, we're called for more than that. We're called to a new life, a life in Christ, not the old corrupt life. And so this time of confession and absolution is a time for us to confess to God, that, oh, yeah, God, forgive me. Forgive me because I... I 
I do put on those old clothes, or I forget I'm wearing the new clothes that Christ has won for me. Forgive me, God. Forgive me when I slink back to those old ways and help me to live anew. We confess our sins and we receive, once again, God's promise, the reminder of what he has done for us in Jesus, that we are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, that we receive the grace of God and our sins have been forgiven. Let's confess our sins now. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we, we praise and we thank you that through the gift of Jesus, through his, his blood shed on the cross, through his, his victorious resurrection from the grave, we have been given a new life. That, that we have actually, your son has actually taken off our old self and, and took it upon himself and given us his righteousness, his holiness. But Lord, while we praise you for that, we ask for your forgiveness in the fact that, that we forget that. We forget that we are, we are new creatures. We forget that we are wearing new clothes, clothes of righteousness and holiness, and we slink back and we start living that old way of life. We, we look to put on those old clothes again, uh, the clothes of lust and, and pride and greed and selfishness. Uh, Lord, uh, the, the clothes that tell us to turn from you and go our own way. Uh, the, the, the clothes that tell us to, to uh, put ourselves above others. Lord, forgive us for that. Remind us once more through the power of your spirit that we are new in Christ of what he has won for us. Lord, help us to, to shed once again those old clothes and, and reveal what Jesus has done for us. Lord, forgive us. And we thank you for the reminder and the promise that is ours that in Christ we are made new and we have been given new clothes. Help us to wear those clothes, Lord, for your glory, for your name and honor, so the world may, may see you, Lord, and come to a saving knowledge. Thank you, Father, for the gift that is ours in Jesus, these new clothes. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Yeah, I, I really can't remember uh, if I wore this last week or not. If I did, like I said, uh, forgive me. But I know, I know that I'm clothed in righteousness, and I know by God's grace through faith that you are too. Let's not go back to the old way of living. Jesus has won for us a new life. He has forgiven our sins and made us whole, made us his. We are living and we are wearing the clothes of righteousness, won for us by Jesus Christ. Let's wear those clothes. And in so doing, let us remember what he has done for us and let's share that good news with others. Your sins, my sins, our sins are forgiven in Christ alone. Amen. All right, so we're in our series on Mark, um, and, and just to let you know, uh, our, so our series today, we're in chapter 13 of Mark, um, but our series will continue uh, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and we'll conclude it on Easter. So we have 13 today, uh, 14, chapter 14 on uh, Monday, Thursday, chapter 15 on uh, Good Friday, and then chapter 16, the last chapter of Mark um, on Easter Sunday. So that's where we are, we're in our series on Mark, and I hope um, it's been a blessing for you. I know it's been a blessing for me. Uh, so if you have your Bible there, I always give out points. Uh, they're, they're not good for anything, right? So um, don't send me an email or text uh, wondering what you've won for all the points you've accumulated, because they're, they're really not good for anything. But uh, I would like to know, though, how many points you have if, you, if you've been with us for a while and you've been adding them up. If, if you're new to us today, um, you're, you're probably behind a little bit on the points. But today, I'm just, I don't know, in a generous mood, so I'm going to give a whole, uh, whole bucket load out there. Um, as I've said before, probably enough to feed a hog. How about 3,000 points? If you have your Bible there um, and you're going to open it up and use it, you get 3,000 points today. All right, uh, part of the reason I'm going to give you 3,000 points is because we're actually reading the whole chapter uh, today. Um, typically what I do is it's hard to cover a chapter in a week, and so I cover what we, what we can't get to here in our Zoom, bi in our Bible study, sorry, in our, um, well, it's our Zoom Bible study too, but our adult class and our Zoom Bible study. And again, those links are on our website, so check those out. Um, but today I'm going to go through the whole chapter, and we'll, there's still, even though I go through it all here, there's still more to cover in our study. So typically I don't read the whole chapter here, but today uh, we are. So uh, hang in there. Here we go. Uh, Mark chapter 13. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings? replied Jesus. Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the Opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are all about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. 
Many will come in my name claiming I am he and he and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumor of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of the birth pains. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given to you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray a brother to death and a father his child. Children will, children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. All men will hate you because of me, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof of his house go down or enter the house or take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get his cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for a pregnant woman and and nursing mothers. Pray that this will not take place in winter, because those will be days of distress, unequaled from the beginning when God created the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets must will appear and perform signs and miracles to deceive the elect, if that were possible. So be on your guard. I have told you everything ahead of time. But in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will give, give its light, will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, men will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. He will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near, right at the door. I tell you the truth. This generation will certainly not pass away until all these, th- these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, of, nor the Son but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each time his assigned, each with his assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. Wow, (laughs) there's a there's a lot in there, right? Prophecies of, of, of um, what's to come sooner and later. We're told of the destruction of, of the temple, of the, of the temple in Jerusalem, uh, once and for all. We're also told of the end times. Uh, we're told there will be natural disasters, right, and famines, and wars, and rumors of, war, uh, rumors of wars. We're told how God's people will be uh, persecuted, how they will be betrayed, how they will be put to death. We're told that the heavens themselves will shake loose. We're told there will be all sorts of of false prophets and messiahs and Christs. But the question is, when? Right? That's what the disciples want to know. They want to know when. They want to specifically know when the temple's going to, uh, you know, come crashing down, never to be rebuilt, um, because they, they just haven't quite grasped everything yet, right? But they want to know when. And, and that's where we are, right? So often we want to know, that's our desire, when? When is the end? When is the end time? When is Jesus coming again? February 1st, 1524. Because of a certain alignment of planets, London astrologers predicted that the world would end on February 1st, 1524. May 19th, 1780. There was an unusual darkness over New England that caused the Shakers to believe that on that date, the end would come. March 21st, 1843 through March 21st, 1844. William Miller led thousands to believe that the world would end between March 21st, 1843 and March 21st, 1844. When he was wrong, he moved the date to October 22nd, 1844. 
1914. In 1876, Charles Taze Russell, the founder of the Jehovah Witnesses, predicted that Jesus, Jesus would return in 1914. 1936, 1943, 1972, and 1975, the founder of the worldwide Church of God, Herbert W. Armstrong, told members of his church that the rapture would take place in 1936 and that only, when, and that, and that only they would be saved. After that prophecy failed, he changed the date three more times. 1982. In May 1980, televangelist and Christian Coalition founder Pat Robertson said the world would come to an end by the end of 1982. 1997. A San Diego UFO, UFO cult, cult named Heaven's Gate claimed the world would end in 1997. May 21, 2011, and October 21, 2011, Harold Camping, president of the Family Radio Network, predicted the world would end on May 21, 2011. When that didn't happen, he changed it to October 21, 2011. These dates, these people, are just the tip of the iceberg of the many dates and the many people over the course of history who have tried to predict the end of time. And look around. Look around. How many of them were right? That's right. None. None of them have been right. And yet, we still, we still expend our time, our energy, our thoughts into trying to figure out when will the end be. Or as I'm asked uh, quite often lately, I'm asked, hey, are, are these the end times? Are we living in the end times? Right, kind of a roundabout way to get to when will the end be. But I'm asked that a lot. Are these the end times? And my answer is always the same. It's the same as what Jesus gives us. And that is, yeah. <laughs> yes, we, we are living in the end times right now. And we have been. We have been since the birth of Christ. We've been living in the end of times. So yes, we are definitely living in the end times. But that's not the answer. That's not the real answer that everybody wants to hear. Everybody wants to know the exact date, right? When will it be? Everybody wants to know the end when the end will be, right? But we won't know. We don't know. In fact, in our text today, if you paid attention, Jesus said at that time, he says, hey, even I am not privy, that, privy to that information. Even I don't know that time. See, that's not our concern. That's not for you and I to know. That, that's not our, our purpose to find out. That's not our purpose. That, that's not our, our um, meaning. That, that, that's not our calling to determine that at all. And Jesus, in, in our text for today, isn't trying to tell us what that date is. He's not, he's not here saying, hey, I, I know you want to know the end, so let me tell you what that date is. No, because he doesn't, right? What Jesus is telling us today is simply this. These are the end times, and here's how you are to live in them. So let's take a look at that, right? Let, let, let's it's not our place to know when the end will be. It's our place to live faithfully in the end times as we wait for that time. So let's see what Jesus has to say to us today about that. <clears throat> to begin with, let's start with the number nine. Nine times. Nine times in our text, Jesus tells us to, to watch out, to be on our guard, to be alert, uh, to, to um, be prepared, to see, right? have a situational awareness. Nine times he says that. Now, of course, you go through this. Some people say, well, you know, it depends where, what you look at. I, I, I see nine times in here. Maybe you'll come up with eight. Um, but I, I got nine times in here where Jesus is telling us, hey, be on your guard. Be on the lookout. The, the question really is, if he says it that often, hey, if he even says it five times in this text, that's a lot, right? But why? For what? What's he want us to be on guard for? Well, a few things. First of all, he wants us to watch out for what he tells us is coming, false teachers, right? The, the false messiahs, the false Christ. Watch out for the deceivers and their false teaching. Now, how do we watch out for them? Well, what, what do we look for? What, what's the telling sign of there's a false teacher or that's false teaching? Well, I can tell you this. It's not going to be they're going to be walking around with a sign saying, hey, I'm a false teacher. Look at me, right? They won't have that. So then how do we know? How do we know if, they're, if somebody is a false teacher? How do we know if, they're, if they're, uh, their teaching is false, a lie, or deceptive? Well, we, we, we listen to what Jesus told us, right? Throughout the Gospel of Mark, 
one of the key words has been hear. Jesus tells us to hear, to listen to him. So how will we know when we come upon a, a false prophet? How will we know if we come upon a, a false teacher or their teaching is false? Well, quite simply, it's this. Are they preaching Christ crucified and risen for the sake of sinful humanity? Are they standing firm on the word of God? Are they, are they loving sinners, right? Because we're all sinners. I got to tell you, if you're here today, if you're with us today, or if you, if you come and join us in, in person, and you come and you go, man, I, I'm good. I, there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm fine. Don't come, right? Don't, don't be here right now because this isn't for you. The church is a place for sinners, right? It's a place for sinners to come and be healed of our brokenness, to acknowledge our brokenness to God, and then to be healed from that, to hear of God's grace. So uh, it, we're called to love sinners, to reach out to sinners, but we're not called to condone the sin. So you'll recognize a false prophet that way. Are they loving sinners, yet not condoning their sin? That's what we see Jesus do, right? He loves the sinners, but he never condones sin. So that's another way uh, that, that we tell if there's a false teacher or not, if, they're, if, they're teach, if their teaching is a lie. Are they seeking glory for themselves, right? Are they more about making um, their own brand, their own kingdom, building their own empire? Or are they about pointing others to Jesus? Are they about Jesus' glory? And pointing to him, because Jesus is the king of glory, and he's the only one worthy of glory. So again, how do, we, how do we know they're doing these things? Only if we're in the word of God. Only if we know what the Bible says. We need to be like the church in Berea. Uh, Acts 17, if you want to go there, that's awesome. Acts 17, listen to what it says. Um, let's see, let me get there. Acts 17, verse 11. It says, now the Bereans were of more noble character than the, than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Right? I love that. That is who we need to be, right? To be alert, to, to not be deceived by these false teachers and false teaching. How will we know? If we're in the word. That's the only way we'll know. And if it doesn't match up here, if I don't match up here, right, th then there's something wrong then look out. It's got to be from God's word. This is what is truth. All right, the second thing that we need to stay uh, alert to, um, or the second reason we need to stay alert, is because we're in the end times. Right? We are in the end times right now. Jesus could come, and we should pray as the church, yes, amen, come Lord Jesus. Right? Jesus could come at any time. The question is, do you believe that? Do you live like Jesus could come at any time? Or are you more of the mindset of, well, you know, he hasn't come yet. So I doubt he's really going to come in my lifetime. You know, it's been a couple thousand years. I don't think he'll come now. So I don't really care. Well, if that's your mindset, um, I want you to listen to what we're about to read from Peter's second leader. Because uh, Peter addresses this attitude and this mindset directly. So Second Peter... Uh, chapter 3, Peter writes this. He says, first of all, you must understand that in the last days, that's what, that's what we're in, the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where, this where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since, be since the beginning of creation. And then I'm going to skip down here to verse 8. Peter writes, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And then he says in verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Right? We don't know when he's going to come. So, when's God going to come? Well, in God's economy, one day, a thousand years. But a thousand years, that's one day. Live like Jesus is going to come today. Because you know what? In all reality, the truth of Scripture is, he can. Are you ready for that?
So be alert. Jesus is coming. And that's good news. But let's go on. Third, we need to pay attention, or maybe not get cut off guard, when persecutions come our way. Right? We shouldn't be surprised when people mock us for our faith, when they don't understand our faith, when they hate us because of Jesus. Jesus tells us this is going to happen. Right? He tells us, hey guys, you're going to face this. He tells us in our text, you will face persecutions. You will face betrayal. You will face death. He tells us it's going to happen. He tells us it's going to happen because it happened to him. Right? He tells us, hey, if they do this to me, Right? The very Son of God, the Savior, the Lord of the universe, if they're going to mock, if they're going to betray, mock, beat, and kill me, it's going to come to you too. Why? Because we are followers of Jesus. We walk in his footsteps. So we shouldn't be surprised when hatred and vitriol come our way, when people mock us for our faith. He says, yeah, that's going to happen because that happened to me as well. In fact, Scripture tells us, believe it or not, says that we should consider it pure joy. We should consider it pure joy when we face those kinds of trials and persecutions. Why? Because Paul tells us when those come our way, then we're counted worthy of the kingdom of God. Right? Because we're associated with Jesus Christ. We're we're one with him. We're letting the world know that Jesus is our Lord, that I am with him. I stand beside him. As he picks up his cross, I pick up my cross. And so if we do that, guess what? We will endure. The Christian church, Christians, individuals, We will endure mocking, scorning, shame. We will endure persecutions, hardships, and yes, even death for our faith. But again, Scripture reminds us, God tells us, hold fast, right? Because you are counted as worthy of my kingdom. It doesn't mean it's easy, though, right? It doesn't make it easy. But there's a, there's a reason and a purpose. One is we're identified with Christ, as we just talked about. But there's also another reason. There's another reason why we, why we endure hardship and persecution. And here it is. Jesus tells us in our text today. Go with me to Mark 13, like I said, our text, uh, and go with me to verse 9. Jesus says, you must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local churches or local councils, Council, sorry, flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given to you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. And that is our calling. That is is our purpose. Not to determine when will he come again, when will the end of the world be. That's not our calling. That's not our purpose. That's not for us to know. Our calling is to give witness, to give witness to the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is what, this is why the church exists. This is what Jesus commands us and tells us to do. Yes, we can do diaper drives. Yes, we can do hygiene drives, hygiene kits. We, we can, we can uh, bring food. We, we, we can um, fix roofs, right? We can feed the homeless. And I, and I want to say from the bottom of my heart, uh, thank you. Thank you for those of you who are doing so, who are bringing the, the, the baby supplies, who are bringing the stuff for the hygiene kits, who are donating food. Thank you for those who are donating money and giving money uh, to those specific causes, but also to the general ministry so we can carry out this ministry. Thank you. But guess what? If it's not attached to, if it doesn't come with a proclamation of the gospel, we're missing it. We're missing our purpose. We're missing our calling. We might as well just be the United Way. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with the United Way. That's great. The United Way does a great function. That's awesome. But guess what? Only Jesus brings life. Only Jesus gives life. Only Jesus brings salvation. So yes, we can, we can fill bellies and we can fix roofs. And that's awesome. But in the end, that's the fades. The only thing that matters is a relationship with Jesus Christ. So yes, let's feed people. Let's, let's give them diapers because that's how we show the love of Christ. Let's fix roofs. Let's supply food. Of course, this is how we show people the love and compassion of Jesus Christ. But it has to come with a proclamation of the gospel. We have to tell them about Jesus. Yes, I know. I know the saying in the quote, right? Uh, to, to, to show that you proclaim the gospel with your actions and if you have to use words. Hey, 
I get it. I know where that's coming from. But if we don't use words, they won't hear it. We have got to tell people the gospel, and that's what Jesus tells us to do here. We have something to say. In fact, we have the only thing that matters in the face of violence and evil and tragedies and hardships. We, we have the only good news that can come out of what happened in Boulder. We have the good news of a resurrected Christ. We have the good news of salvation, of life after death. We have a God who speaks into tragedy because he himself has come to redeem it. Jesus endured the greatest tragedy and overcame it so that those of us who put our faith in him will overcome as well. We have something to say in the face of tragedy. We have the the undeserved, unsurpassed, unrelenting love of God found in Christ alone. The church has that. We have that as Christians. So it's up to us to proclaim it. And that's what Jesus is saying here. Right? He's saying, guys, your job is not to guess the time when I'm coming. Your job is to proclaim the gospel. Yes, you bet. Bring food when you do it. Provide diapers for babies. Make hygiene kits. Fix homes. You bet. And in doing so, Tell people the gospel. Tell them the good news. When people mock you, when they hate you because of me, use that as the opportunity to stand firm in your faith and proclaim my love and my grace and my forgiveness. We have the good news. No one else does. No one else can speak into evil. No one else can speak into tragedy. No one else, no one else can speak into the hopelessness and helplessness of this world except for the church of Jesus Christ except for those who know him. It's up to us. Right now is not the time for us to step back. Now is not the time for us to shrink back. Now is not the time for us to say, you know, it's been a tough year. And amen, it has been a tough year. I get it. For, for all of us, some in more profound ways. And, and this year, right, 2021, just got tougher for a lot of people. I understand that and God knows that better than any of us. But now is not the time for us to pull back. As I said, we just entered our stewardship campaign. I said in our letter, in the letter I wrote, I said, we are here as Concordia, as Christians, for such a time as this. This is the time for us to rise up. This is the time for us to speak out. This is the time for us to actually be the church, for us not to shrink back, not as individuals and certainly not as God's church. Now is the time for us to be what we are called to be. Right? And so how do we do that? Well, we do it by stepping up in prayer. Man, I covet your prayers for the ministry here at Concordia. Prayer is the power behind all things. We have to be people of prayer. So I pray, I ask you to pray for the mission and ministry here that God's given us. Because in prayer we can do mighty things. I, I pray for your, um, I, I ask you also to, to give of your time. Right, of service. And I know right now uh, we're just beginning to open up, but we're setting things in place. Things are becoming, are, are opening up. We're going to need people to step into those, those avenues and say, yes, I'm ready to step in. I'm ready to help. I'm ready to serve. Right? We need you to do that. I talked about our VBS coming up. We're going to need volunteers for that. Right? How cool. I'm so excited about our VBS. Right? I can't wait for it. I love that time of year, but it needs people to step up into that. And that's just one example. Right? We've, we've got people delivering stuff all over the place to the, the foodies and the action center. People giving people rides. And, and more, as we begin to open up, we'll need more. And yes, right, in our, in our stewardship letter, of course, I say our, our tithes and our offering. Because in that, in giving of our tithes and our offering, in not holding back, but actually stepping up, we are making confession to this world. We are, we are, we are, we're telling ourselves and we're letting God know that we're with you in this. God, we believe that we are here for such a time as this. We believe that. I believe we are. I believe Concordia is here for such a time as this. Otherwise, I think we'd be gone. Right? I think this, this year would have devastated us, and it hasn't, because I think God has a plan for us. I believe that in my heart. I believe that in my spirit. I know God has a plan for us, but it's going to take all of us to step up and not to shrink back. Now's not the time for us to close up the, the wallet and the checkbook. Now's not the time for us to, to shrink back and say, well, I, I, I don't have the time or I don't, feel, I don't feel like serving. Now's not the time. The time is now for us to step up. Right, to proclaim, not for our glory, 
Certainly not so Concordia's name can be out there. Certainly not for mine at all, right? But for the glory of God, so people can know of Jesus and his salvation. This is what it is about. This is our calling. So I, I, I ask you, I, I urge you to go to read, to read the letter, to go to our, to go to our website, to, to turn in your card if you got one in the mail, um, and say, yes, yes, I am with you. I believe, as you do, Greg, I believe that now is the time that we are here for such a time as this, and God is going to use us in mighty and powerful ways to proclaim his name, to reach people for him. Now is the time not to shrink back, but to step up, to be bold, to be courageous, to be the church. Finally, finally the words that Jesus speaks to us today in this text, they're ultimately words of hope and victory. I know oftentimes if we read this, we go, whoa, man, you know, I don't see much hope in here. Are you kidding me? This is so hopeful. This is so victorious. Go with me. Go with me to, to Mark 13, uh, starting in verse 24. Jesus says, But in those days following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly body, bodies will be shaken. At that time, men will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heaven. That's good news, Right? Because what it's telling us there is God hasn't left us. God never leaves us. In fact, what, we, what Scripture tells us is that Jesus says, I am with you always. We are, we are living temples. The Spirit dwells inside of each and every one of us. God is with us, behind us, before us, and beside us. And inside us, God dwells in us. God never leaves us. He never abandons his people, which means no matter what we face, no matter what this world throws at us, no matter what we go through, God not only is with us, but he will sustain us, and he will see us through. And not only that, but he will take us home with him. Look what it says there. He will gather his elect. He will gather those who remain faithful to him. You know what this is saying to us? Bottom line is this. Our God wins. This is good news. Our God wins. And because he wins, by God's grace, through faith, in the victorious death and resurrection, we win too. What glorious news is that? And that's the news we have to share. That's the news we have to share with this world. That our God wins. Our God overcomes, and all those who put their faith and hope and trust in him will overcome as well. But it takes all of us. It takes me, it takes you, it takes young, it takes old, it takes men, it takes women. It takes all of us to do this. It takes all of us with our time. It takes all of us with our money. It takes all of us with our resources. It takes all of us on our knees, praying and giving and serving to proclaim the word of God. Because you know what? You know what? God's deepest desire is that all people would come to know him. But they will not know him unless we tell others about him. There is no doubt. We saw it this week. There is unspeakable, senseless tragedy in this world. There is no doubt that Christians near and far undergo all sorts of persecution. Some are being killed. Some are in prison for life. Some are being mocked and hated. Yes, that is happening in our world, but our God speaks into that. Our God redeems that, and our God has a place for us in this to speak his truth, to speak life, to give hope to the helpless. I tell you what, your neighbor, your neighbor who is lonely, they need this. Your friend, who once again is rocked by the violence and tragedy in our world, they need this. The world, just as you and I need this, the world needs this as well. I gotta tell you, when Jesus comes again, he's not gonna ask us, hey guys, who was close to the state? He's not gonna hand out prizes to those who got close. He's gonna ask us, what have you been doing? What have you been doing? Have you been standing firm in your faith? Right? Have you been standing firm on my word? Have you, have, you, have you been standing close to me? Have you been proclaiming the gospel? Have you been loving others as yourself? Have you been serving God by serving your fellow man? What have you been doing? Have you been, have you been me to this world? And have you told this world 
about me. That's what he's going to be asking us. Not if we got close to a date. Listen, it's not about predictions. It's not about predictions. It's about proclamation. It's about proclaiming the word of God. It's about telling others about Jesus Christ and what he has done. Listen, I say this all the time. If we don't say it, they won't hear it. We know the good news. We have the good news. So it's incumbent upon us by the power of God's spirit to tell others about his love, about the saving grace of Jesus, about the good news, the great news, the life-giving news that Jesus gave his life for all of us. Let's live it. Let's proclaim it. Let's be Christ and share Christ out in this world. And that's probably enough for today. At this time, we continue with uh, the, the service of the sacrament. So I'm going to go back to the altar and grab uh, the elements back there. So this is the time for you to grab yours, uh, the, the wine and the, the uh, bread or crackers and, and juice if you're, if you're using grape juice. Um, I'll go back and grab mine. There's some, there's, there's some big stuff in our text for today, isn't there? I mean, there, there just is. Uh, we, we know. Jesus doesn't say, hey, guys, until I come again, you got ponies and rainbows, right? He says, it's hard times. You're in the end times. There, there will be distress, right? Betrayals and persecutions and all sorts of stuff. But he says, hey, don't worry because I've overcome. Remember what I said? Our God has won. Jesus is one. And this meal reminds us of that truth. It reminds us that, that in Christ, we, he not only has one, but we are victorious as well. Because in this meal, we receive the true body and blood of our crucified and risen Savior. We receive his body and blood for our forgiveness, for the strengthening of our faith, so that we can indeed open our mouths and share with this world what they desperately need, the truth of Jesus Christ, his love, his grace, his message of salvation. We continue now with the words of institution. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And after he'd given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take and eat. This is my body, which has been given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup. And when he'd given thanks, he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take and drink all of you. This cup is New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We pray now together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus says, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Jesus says, take and drink. This is my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. And now may this, the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. The good news is our God wins. Therefore, we win too. And you know what? God wants everyone to win. He wants them all to know him. Let's open our mouths. Let's proclaim his grace and his truth. Let's stand firm. It's not going to be easy, but God gives us the strength. He gives us his spirit. He is with us and he will take us home. Let's share that good news with this lost and hurting world. We'll see you next time.